Yeah, it's a shame. I, I miss Mike Nelson show. I heard it uh, must have been amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was totally awesome. Yeah, it was an, it, yeah, it felt quite an immense show. It was quite a big show. I must have some pictures. like from outer space, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's really amazing because then they really become something else yeah. those times. And you couldn't walk on the concrete, so. That's concrete. Yeah, solid yeah. concrete. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just get the book out if you <coughs> To be honest, I'm, I'm staring and I'm... <laughs> I'm just staring, going through the... You're in the perfect place. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. I look all right, I can't really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Flowers, I think, are too hard. Yeah, yeah, I try to ignore that. I try to. It's not easy. No, not when you put it in front of you. Showing us the picture. When we're gonna use the images? Well, you'll have to go over. I do it. Yeah, just yeah at least then I have something to do. Yeah. Because it will be there where I'm sitting now, so I'm just gonna go behind. So the conversation should shouldn't uh, should be pretty free flowing. Hopefully. So <laughs> no <laughs> pressure. <laughs> um, so after the discussion, um, we'll be delighted to welcome your questions. So um, that part, I'd just like to hand over to say thank you very much, and uh, look forward to everybody's questions. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. 
Uh, we will be throwing out flowers at the end for you all as well. <laughs> Those who catch them will get extras. As well, <laughs> Extra <we'll see>. song. <laughs> um, and, I, and I am also feeling like I would like to swing on the chandeliers. And, I, and somehow I think that's, that's part of, com hopefully connected to our conversation this evening. That um, you want to do things in different sorts of spaces. Um, so we, we've got a little, a little bit planned, but not very much. Um, or it might actually turn into a lot, I'm not sure yet, because we haven't really worked it all out. But I've asked Caroline some questions, and she's, uh, she's thought of some to ask me, and I've just had a quick look at. And then I think we will um, open some out as well, to, to you lot, hopefully. Um, but also, and I'm still absorbing the exhibition, so we thought that's probably the best way to start. And um, I will try and encourage things out of, out of Caroline about her work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, it already started when I came in and I, and I was looking at the typeface on the back wall and wondering then that that's, it's an interesting position to have a graphic that's the title of the exhibition, that's within the exhibition and very much evident um, and active in the space, it, you know, it feels like it's exhibiting. So I asked that simple question and I said, is, is, is that part of your work? Have you, have you made that? And Caroline started to tell me a little bit, which you, you could say yeah, some more in a minute. I can, but, yeah. but, the, but the one thing was that I was th thought that it looked a bit different and they got it wrong because when I got the invites for the show before, I read it as Camp Goo. And I've had more than one invite, so I've, had, I've seen a couple of things and seen it lots of times and knew that this was going to happen and kept in my head it was always Camp Goo. And I looked at that and said, that looks more like a C than a G. And is it, and is it meant to be Camp Coo, not Camp Goo? And, and of course she looked at me like I was crazy and saying that's what it's always been called. But I thought that might be a starting point. But, but for me, I've misread something that's already... It's, it's the typeface's fault that I've misread it because it's purposefully problematic and sending me the wrong signals. But the signal that I've received is that, and what I think now, is that goo, the word goo, must be, in my mind, a connection to Caroline's work. What that does it must... stand for? Goo. <laughs> goo I really wouldn't like, know. Is like, the, is like squid, okay. squidgy, gungy okay. material okay. that might, okay. Okay. That might yeah, that's drift. Mm -hmm. or... <laughs> so I just thought, <clears throat> I love the sound of Camp Goo. That's cool. I want to be in Camp Goo. Um, and then when he said Camp Goo, I mean, I had to think, but why is it coup? Yeah, why is the coup? Except for then I, know, I already knew from working together that, that there is this sense of the relationship between material and, and sound and language and the way that we might think about an object through how it, not, not, not exactly what you might think about it or, what, or even what you might reference particularly, but what you think that object might even sound like which I think is quite a powerful idea. So I think between goo and coo already is a really interesting way to think about um, the work and how you encounter it mm -hmm. and what, those, um, what, what, what things you bring to, to the work. So, but, but I think we should, I should ask you a little bit more to explain where, where the typeface is and how that, how that works. Okay, um, <clears throat> it's a good starting point for the whole journey of this exhibition. Um, so this exhibition originally was shown in um, Hertfordshire and I've been invited to make a residency there in the ceramic workshop and I was also invited to do an exhibition and the space is very postmodern. And um, so, and yeah, quite open plan. So I <clears throat> quite early on had a vision I would like to make this agglomeration of furniture so that would house maybe the ceramic work I would like to show there. And, um, and the tafta piece that was suspended in the other space should be maybe like a membrane between the public space and the exhibition space. Um, so <clears throat> um, in my head, this kind of, I had this, the idea formed that it's like a camp, yeah? So this kind of, this kind of characters coming from this other world have arrived in this quite cold um, exhibition space in comparison to here, which is Georgian and feels quite warm. There's a lot of glass and concrete. 
So, um, <clears throat> so in my head it became this, uh, this space where the, um, the ceramic work would find itself in, in conjunction with the tufted piece, but obviously the work wasn't made, um, or some of the work hasn't been made at this point. Was that, and was that partly because the, you were showing me some pictures of the space and saying that, that parts of the area of the gallery space used to be outdoors? Yeah, and then they covered it over. Exactly, exactly. So it still has a slightly outdoor... Indoor, outdoor feel, yes. exactly. And, um, and I really like postmodernist post -modernist design. I'm a really big fan of Ettore Sozza's in Memphis. And so in combination with the idea of this camp, and I, I like the flow of words, so the camp had to have a name. And Kuku, I like doubling of vowels. And obviously, if you double the word, you get something like cuckoo, but I didn't, this was just one reading of it. Anyway, I was, I knew this uh, exhibition would be called Camp Coo because it would refer to this other place. And then I thought it would be really nice if that would actually reflect in the way it's written. And I've, I spoke to a friend, Tim Barnes, who is a graphic designer, and I described him what I would like the, like the word, what I would like the title and the, <clears throat> the font to do, that it becomes objects in itself. And I showed him a few references to postmodernism, to things I like. And he did an amazing jo job in developing this uh, font for me. And the decision <clears throat> to have it in the exhibition, it's like, it's, all, it's like a piece in itself. Mm -hmm. So I have, I mean, I commissioned it. I didn't kind of develop it. It's, it's highly but skilled. Did you, did you tweak it with him? Did you go no, through some of the shapes? No, I, I, I told him what I wanted and he made it for me. I, I'm not lying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tweak it at all. I left, um, yeah. And, um, but, and it but, has but, different but was it still quite surprising for it, you? Yeah, it was very surprising. Yeah. I mean, it's, the one surprise was when I got the design and it works really well on an invitation card, black and white. The second surprise was when I had it vinyled in a similar size and here and on the wall, because then all the machine parts really become um, more um, detailed. Like here, the, the rivet through the moon in the first Oh, of ooh, of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, then it becomes slimmer when it's kind of pushed through the moon. Things like that I didn't even notice before. So it's kind of, um, <clears throat> it has this kind of engine-like feel. It, uh, like, yeah, it has a, today I find it quite motorist, yeah. The, um, mm -hmm. And there was also, there was a bit of info I picked up recently, I think I heard it a couple of times now, about a year ago and just more recently, saying that, to, that if you read something in a slightly quirkier, more unusual typeface, you're more likely to remember the information because your brain has to work a little bit harder to work out what, it, what it's saying, which I thought was a really interesting yeah. point, partly because I've worked with de designers also who have made unusual typefaces and always thought there's something a strength about it, so suddenly there was a bit of evidence that seemed like we could use it to support um, a crazy mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. And I like if uh, a, a title has, doesn't only work on, a, on the me level of meaning, but on, the, on a visual level and on a, vocal, a, wow, um, a sound level as well. Yeah. I do that with all my work, so it was really important for me it would work on this visual level and on this sound level. So with, with Cuckoo, you're thinking that it means slightly crazy. Yeah, also I, I deliberately, I, it's not called, it's not Camp Cuckoo. Yeah. It's, it's just one of the many possibilities. Yeah, yeah. So it's not <clears throat> half crazy. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> half wit, half crazy. <laughs> but also I like that idea of the, depending on the order of the letters, it, the next, the, the type of M that it produces or whichever letter might change, which is might be, could be seen as a way of moving from space to space. So mm -hmm. you, move, you make an exhibition in one gallery and then you move to another gallery. How do you, how do you find yourself altering the works as you move from one space to another? Yeah, that's been a really interesting experience. I think it's the first time I did a traveling ex exhibition as such. Obviously you show similar work. You know, sometimes you show a, a piece more than at once in one space. But there was a whole exhibition complex um, with the <clears throat> ceramic works. Um, 
because they have this self-contained design units. They sit in, um, it's the feel here is less, yeah, it's, it's, it's different, but the difference is not as strong as with the tufted piece that was um, um, hanging from the ceiling or, or was, let's say, attached <coughs> to two poles and hanging from the ceiling yeah, in the other space. So here, um, you have to make it just work in that space. But do you find yourself using any... Um, oh, I suppose if you're saying you've only done it once, then you wouldn't yet. But I was wondering whether you might start finding methods that you already rely on. So when you go into a space and something changes, you think, oh, well, I, I've done this before, I can, I can use this idea now to, to alter, to make the work suit this space now. Yeah, with individual pieces, I can do that. Yeah. But um, this is a bit like an exhibition. It's like a complex. It's, it is more complex, and it is a, like, yeah, it's just a group of work that kind of belong together. And what about imposing conditions onto the new space so that you might turn up and say, well, that, well I can't have a wall that's got a, a slight return. <coughs> I need a completely flat wall, and it has to be 10 meters long. Um, otherwise, the exhibition can't happen. To make demands. Yeah. Well, when I saw the space here the first time, <clears throat> there were a lot of artificial space, uh, walls in there. Mm -hmm. And actually, in Hertfordshire, there was also an, an normally a wall that separates the space. And I, I think, and that's something I learned by um, doing those exhibitions, because I don't see myself as a site-specific art, artist, really. I like <clears throat> a truth to a space. I think I often quite like to have artificial walls removed and just take the, the space as what it is and then mm -hmm. react onto that. That works more for me than <clears throat> like, um, like uh, implying um, fake um, walls or demands on a space to make it something that it's not by, na by nature. Yeah. Um, yeah, was it the question? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wonder if it might be worth, I sort of want to, I want to get into one of your questions that you asked me, because I think it might um, open up some of the other areas. Mm -hmm. And it's just that, uh, so I said, I, I was thinking that it was, it was my job to ask some questions, but I thought it might be the case that the art, that each artist might, may have some questions that they, re what they really want to know about their work, but it's really hard to find out, because Sometimes, let's say if you're, you're doing your own, you, you have your show on it, you're, you're opening, or you meet people, and you always want to hear what they really think, but it's, it might be a little bit awkward of how you say, but is it really good? Is it actually interesting? What is it? And how do you get an honest opinion about things? And there are questions in there that also might not be on the surface all the time, but they might be the, the thing that you forget to ask all the time. So I just thought... Um, I would, I would say that to Caroline, that there are things that she wants to know about her work, and I might not know the answer. <laughs> you know, I might not be able to answer it, but that, that might be a useful way as well. But I mentioned this to Ruth Claxton earlier today, who works at Eastside Projects with me, and, and she said to me, you're so cruel, I'm never going to do a talk with ask you to come and do a talk with me, that's horrible. That I, don't want to, I would never want to do that. It so. is hard, <laughs> because it has a ref self-reflective moment in it to ask, yeah. it was the hardest part. I but part that. of me, I don't know, always felt like that would be the case and other people might be asking questions and doing things around but you might never it might be hard to ask the right thing to get the right answer for the work or I mean it might even just be that you don't well there's no right answer I yeah, don't know, <laughs> you might not know the answer that you really want to hear but there was one and one which I, I really like, like this question and it, it just said do you find it hard or easy to write about my work and I, and, I, and I think within that, there's, there's an element of revealing how the art world works, that, it's, that it relies on this transferring of, la of, of, of language. It's about um, um, theorizing about the work, about mythologizing about the work, about how other people do it. And that within that, that I thought, actually, I, I'm not a natural, I don't write many essays directly about artworks in a way. And I think, I, I used to think that I should do, 
but I got to a point where I found that that wasn't really my, my strength. It wasn't what I, what I really wanted to, to, to do. And, I, and as we were just walking around and chatting earlier, I started to think, actually, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't find it hard or easy to write about the work given the option because I wouldn't, that wouldn't be my response to write about the work and to use words that I'd rather, I'd rather build something for the work. I'd rather design something for you for the work. That would be my response to make an idea. object, to make a structure that the work, because because that's already fascinating to me the way that you start to build these structures around the work and they protect them and shield them and offer them a backdrop and. A, yeah, they're almost like a habitat for me. That's where they yeah. live. Yeah. And that's something that I connect with very much. It's something I've always felt is part of my practice as, mm -hmm. a, as a curator, is to think about that idea of support. And, um, and I'd also learned... It took me a long time, really, to, to realise... I always thought, I, I can write about my, the things that I do. I can just write about them, and I'll create my own myths about it. But, and I'm, I'm sort of quite good at it sometimes, but then it takes a while before you realise some people are probably better than... And other people are better than me at doing it, and I should, I should rely on them to do that sometimes. So I've had the occasion um, where a writer has suddenly written an amazing text about things that I've done, and I was saying to her, I'd, 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 never, I'd never consider it from that point of view at all. And she said... Well, that's not your job to do that, is it? That's my job. Mm. That's my job. As the, as the, as the, I'm, I'm a theorist, and you're not a theorist. You're, you're an artist. You're an artist curator. You go and do your thing. I'm, I'm a theorist. It's my job to theorise about your work. So it's got nothing to do with you, which I, I quite liked that, that idea. So there would be, I think then, then there would be people who, um, and someone whose entire focus on theorising I think it would be, it would be, e it would be easy for them because they're already programmed to start responding to all these different aspects going on within your work. But it would never be. Perhaps it would be mildly interesting to you what they had to say about your work. You know what, <laughs> what I mean? That that would might not be. That you would maybe never ask that que ask that question. So that there would. But I think within it is this this sense of coup and goo as well. This sense of the the difference between one thing and, and another, that writing is, might be only interesting in relation to Carolyn's work for that, that very tiny little word or two words that might be the title of the work, that, that that's, that's where it's most interesting because, so it might be, it would be really hard for me to come up with, to write two words about each work that would be satisfying mm -hmm. that would really do a lot of work like I, I think that when I look at your titles I think you you really get them right and you make it like they don't close anything down and they open it all up in interesting ways but then you know that, so then what would my what would my question be like how do you come up with your titles how do you write them what's the methodology when it might not be again you it, I that guess I ask you question. that question also because that's one of the ways we met before when you actually wrote up in an indirect, well, yes. through question and answer about my book. Interview. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in that case, then that was, <laughs> that, was, that was hard to find the words that would do the work enough justice. You know, that's, that's hard. I didn't feel, felt that's narrowed it. down at all. <laughs> But that's always the challenge in in working, and that's in the writing, challenge that you want. Yeah, yeah you want have that to that's, open that's it a, up instead of narrowing it down. Yeah, yeah. it's a responsibility. Mm. Yeah. To to do your work justice, you know. So that's always, um, which is what every gallery or every curator or every should should feel should feel that that pressure. Mm. I, I think. Um, but let, let's. Let's put some images on, and, and I ask you some questions. <coughs> Let's see where they show up. Because I, because I thought if it's not about, if I'm not going to ask Carolyn about uh, meaning or theories, 
or perhaps we can get to some subject matter perhaps as well or re references and that um, just go, go to the slide for me. that I might have to would have to ask questions that might reveal aspects of how how she practices as an artist in a way that that might that might be interesting about those those processes those okay, yeah, ways that she desktop. makes things and who she makes them oh, with okay. what all those people are around around her oh the whole thing turned off yeah again. I didn't know <laughs> okay you can just could you click on the slide for me there's a whole screen um oh, sorry not okay if you switch this off <laughs> uh, yeah this one the, on the right no this one yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. <clears throat> so how bad was it I don't know. <laughs> so was this, was this in relation to my first question? Yeah. So I, one of my questions was, what do you consider your breakthrough work? I tried to ask really fast questions, <laughs> things that came to mind, and I, had, I actually thought that that might always be an interesting question for an artist. So um, I guess the language thing again, breakthrough, I guess there are two ways of reading it, yeah? either like break, breakthrough in a public way that you get acknowledged more or like an important piece or like personal breakthrough piece. And so this is a personal breakthrough piece, I would say is a, just a small ink drawing called Blob. And I made it in 2002 and this led to my first tufted piece. So when I studied it, <coughs> um, I did a master's at Goldsmiths College and um, Previously, I made large-scale installations and wall paintings, <clears throat> um, and I made this really intense small drawings that um, had a psychological level, if you like. This is very basic and abstract. They be sometimes became more complex and also related to masks, clowns, and images from horror or so. so they had, but they all had a certain intensity. But coming back to this one, um, I really liked it, but because I worked on a larger scale before and I really always like my work to have a relation to the space, um, I had an idea in translating that to a, into a carpet, having no idea how to do that because I have no textile background whatsoever. Well, what's, like, that, what's that little leap that, because you say then you had the idea to translate it to a carpet, what was I the... wanted it to, um, to apply to space, to a, to a space, to room, mm -hmm. to, um, but at the time, also, it was related to what I guess is the um, uncanny. And I, so I wanted it to relate to a domestic space. And then I thought it would be maybe a great idea to make it into a carpet. <clears throat> and is domestic space something that's featured in writings about the uncanny anyway? Is it well, the, I, um, the, it comes from something that is um, scary with him, your like familiar surroundings. Yeah, that's my notion of the uncanny. So, I mean, it sounds like very literal and my the work now has changed the motivation, but at the time that kind of led to the this first decision to work with the wool and make the first carpet. And so luckily <clears throat> at, the, at Goldsmiths College, I was allowed to use their um, facilities to make this carpet. and. The first piece was just called Woolen Face and it's black and white and actually is similar to that image. And I don't have an image of the piece here now. But um, so this was personally a breakthrough moment when I made this transition from this really tiny intense drawing to this large scale uh, piece that kept the, intensi kept the intensity because of the materials I chose. Yeah, um, this, The drawing is intense because of the ink and the kind of small size. And the tufted piece kept the intensity because it's this large image consistent of all those many fibers that hold this image together. Mm -hmm. And then the next image, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the next image, another, in a similar context, this is the piece that led to my ceramic work. So I, I've been making watercolor drawings for quite a while and then I started making paper objects and I was had a string, strong interest in and I still have in ethnological collections and masks. So I, I used some unsuccessful drawings and lino cuts and I cut them up and made them into paper objects. Mm -hmm. And because before I became an artist I used to work as a blacksmith, I have this uh, skill of working with metal without ever using it in my artwork and I just thought I quickly weld those uh, small stands, 
yeah, stands. And, um, and obviously, <coughs> with this, with this um, particular cabinet, it has a strong ethnological connection, maybe too strong now, but I mean, I really liked it in that context. This was just borrowed for the exhibition. And I really, f when I made those, I felt yeah, I really would like to continue, but I would like the work to be larger. And then and the paper. Were, you were already thinking of masks as a central aspect yeah, of the yeah, work. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. And um, so in a way, the stands holding the masks, but they become also a bit like the body for the head part. So I did like this aspect of it. And um, <laughs> um, <coughs> anyway, so I thought I would like to maybe extend it to body size, which means the metal part would become larger and the ceramic part would become larger as well. Uh, not the, the paper part and realized that paper is, it became too flimsy and that kind of led to um, the idea of trying to use ceramic in a way and yeah, I, in, to, in particular what's called paper clay because I really try when I work with ceramic I try to um, emulate the work I did with paper through creasing and folding I really wanted to be as thin and as um, not, it's not so much about the fragility, but I, um, more about the, that it looks malleable. You could still change it. It's still, it's in a process. It's viscous. It's not finished yet. That's, I, um, I wanted <coughs> to maintain that. I discovered that ma quality in ceramic. It didn't have the quality in paper, but um, I, I maintained this process, this approach, as if I would work with paper, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, what's interesting about seeing those as breakthrough points is how they're still there in the work so much. There still seems fundamental underpinning ways of thinking about what, you know, what, what your hands do, what, you, what mm -hmm. your decisions are, of how one thing fits to the next. I, mean, I, really, I love the little, the one that's around the back in the blue section of that box over there where the the triangles. Yeah, the triangle. So they have the triangular the triangle. support, and then the, the ceramic part over the top. It also has the triangular pattern on it, and it, it and and that all of it um, feels like it, it could fall over because of the structure, because of the sort of engineering of it in a way. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so there's that, and then I really like that. It's got one little screw that yeah. just goes through it, and the screw just feels fantastic. I really love this. Yeah, yeah it's true one because I did cover that up together. before. It's the first time it's not covered up, and I just I thought love the screw. it's just yeah, it's okay, and it's fine. It's, uh... <laughs> but I like that uh, <clears throat> reciprocal space that in those ones, then the the body part of the structure is speaking a very different language to the head mm -hmm. or the, to this idea that's been supported by, by yeah. the structure and in there they're speaking to each other yeah. like they're still quite different they still do have a, a different job but they just acknowledge each other in a really yeah. interesting way mm -hmm. so I think that's that's great to be looking across a body of work and seeing how those things uh, interconnect mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and these Before cups that know. you made. No. Sure. <laughs> you can choose which one do you like most. Um, <clears throat> let's maybe go to the next image, find the question to the image. <laughs> yeah, no, but we're, so there was, a, the, there was a big, an early rug piece. Ah, yeah, insider is, and, fe and feather. Yeah, this is um, maybe my personal highlights. And, um, so was that, in, was that a continuation the of, the of the first question? No. Um, or is it a, another question? Is it I think it's a person, it's like a, no, the pinnacle, there's no image with it. It's I, more I like asked, for my favorite, my personal favorite piece. I asked, what is the pinnacle of your technical achievement okay. as an artist? There's no picture for that. <laughs> so, <they're, they're laughs> so she's played the modesty card on that one. Yeah. You see what she, where she There's did. no picture for that. <laughs> I, think, I think actually it's uh, to keep the terrain open between being maintaining being playful and skillful. Yeah? I yeah. think this is this fine kind of fine line in between. If there's a pinnacle, then I think that's maybe my strengths. But it only works with certain materials. That it kind of, I guess, what you call looks effortless or so. But um, yeah. that's not only about the effortless. It's just this kind of that is, yeah. 
that this 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 uh, moment you in, enjoy in the making or the yeah the yeah as I say so this playful think, moment. Did you think that that was a cheeky question? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's the, that this. No, this is not. This is not. Feels uh, very it's called a Smith Row presentation. Oh, so sorry. I was talking. The different. I thought because uh, because the, cause the, the material production feels really it's sophisticated. Just this so Smith Row. That was a fair um, if you go back, it's not <laughs> in this one. It's not in this one. Um, sorry. Yeah. If you just um, anyway. It's. I can also hold it up. Actually, I have a printout. Maybe it's easier. I don't have a printout. So my the person. Oh, um, yeah. Anyway, there's other, there's other two pictures were just highlights of yeah pieces I made. But I think this this is, has been abandoned now. Is that dead? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was looking forward to this. But the, the other the um, the other artwork we can hold up. I think yeah. that's no problem. But I should. Well, okay. I, I, I will say, uh, Caroline sent five images of works, and I wrote down the first five words that came into my head when I looked at them. So I'm just going to tell you them, and then you're going to have to imagine what Caroline's work was. So the first one is cat, death, power, gran, etching. Gran? Yeah. What, like granny? Yeah, no. granny. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that's because my, my gran used to do... Uh, make rugs okay. and used yeah, to yeah, fair enough. <laughs> have like um, I guess this was the 1980s so then it would have been it was the cowboys and, and red Indians that's how they would have been described and that she went to America and then came back with all these rugs and then I would help her do, do it so that's totally a personal connection that yeah, yeah. links and to this the is quite rugs. obvious actually I don't know why it surprised <laughs> me so much <laughs> and then there's, there's lots of other interesting words but it's not really But it, cause I, so, but partly I was thinking of how you how we reference how much you attempt to play on or tug at certain um, feelings in people or connections because because I thought it looked like a cat and was one of the pieces yeah that the the rug the mm -hmm. first rug looked like a cat and was, okay and was that an intentional mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. okay I think I've never. I mean, not the images, at least not the images I send you there, no. <laughs> okay, it's just me then. Okay. But what they both have, the two images, like um, a coexistence of like two kind of characters or so, like a multiple personality they both have. And a lot of images yeah. have, uh, not images just, but pieces have that like a, a duality or a coexistence. Like and so a, when you're doing that, are you, are you literally doing that, like picking two reference images that you might refer to as you're making it? Um, well, the process has a bit changed, but um, so, I mean, as a starting point, I certainly have already a, a rough idea, and then those two, um, this coexistence is already present, but then I, through the process, I work it out more. I don't have, it's not a reference to, what do you mean reference from something? Yeah, whether you, you know, find an image of something. No, I, I make it, it's not found anymore. It, I mean, it comes, I mean, obviously everything is, comes from somewhere, but it's more, I, I, I have a, a source, um, I certainly um, look, I, as I said, I like going to collections and I have an interest in masks, let's say, but also in all kinds of other things. And then I, um, I'm, I want this, <clears throat> this piece to have a certain intensity and um, have a specific idea. It can be influenced by all kinds of things. And then I develop a drawing and take it from there. Okay. Yeah. So what you want to do, you want to hold up these other... Yeah, we can. I mean, we, you uh, asked me to uh, maybe... Um, show five images or talk about other things that influence me or... Yeah. Um, well, this is a reference to the... I can't remember now why I came up with the outsider artist. But it's a, I think this is a question I asked you or we maybe you can talk about why do you think there's such a... At the moment, <coughs> this is a picture by um, Auguste, Auguste Lesage. It's an outsider artist. 
And I, I'm sure you've noticed at the moment there's a big revival of outside art. So that picture, the, the real thing is, they're, they're pretty big. They're sort of, they're quite large frame, yeah. like tall, as tall as that section of the wall, and incredibly detailed, like illuminated manuscript mm -hmm. um, illustrations. And I, since a while I, I've, I have an interest in that, so I mean, as a background, but I don't want to take the answer away now, but um, well, I've only, I just I've only just seen that at Venice, uh, in the Venice Biennale that's on at the moment, so I'd never come across that but, work before. Yeah, it's not necessarily only about him, it's just a phenomena, you know, the, in the Hayward yeah. Gallery in London, they had this, an exhibition dedicated to outsider art, uh, and um, yeah, I just, it's a, a big focus on outside art in the main, within the mainstream art world, so I just was wondering if, why, why so you think it, that is? I don't know, could it be that curators and institutions are bored of all the ordinary <laughs> artists. They're just too boring, and they're all working to the laws and rules of, of the art world, and they, wanna, they want more than that. I think it's a fantasy of some, some renegade, some radical thinker who is just not known. And, you know, it's just sort of, it's almost it's a bit fetishistic. Yeah. But don't you think it's a focus in general in the art world that people are more interested in process again? and like the kind of microcosmos people develop within themselves and they have this thirst for that and whereas five years ago was more about a concept or so? I, don't, I mean, I, w I wonder if it's something to do with the, um, the almost like the, un the untrained artist, mm -hmm. so the artist that's not, that's not gone through a particular system. I'm just wondering if there might be a relationship between that and this and the idea of, um, you know, that you might you might have a journalist saying, uh, talking five minutes about a subject, but then there would equally be five minutes that comes from amateurs, people on the street, whoever, someone tweeting something else in. So you don't you you want the trained opinion, the the thing that someone's spent all their life doing and working towards and, and then they're, they're able to report on something, but then you want this other, you want this um, unknown element. I mean, it's a little bit of a, that's a bit harsh in a way, because I think that the difference is, is that you, it's almost pandering to the idea of um, in journalism and just the, the media at the moment sort of pandering to the idea that everybody's opinion counts, which of course is rubbish. Everyone's opinion does not count, and it's and most of them will be useless and uninteresting and not necessary at all. But they're they're trying to push this idea that everyone's opinion counts for whatever, anything, and everyone's opinion counts and will make a difference. But all it will do is provide fill space and fill content. And so, but it, so so it's a disservice to someone who might have been called an outsider artist because they just haven't gone through a system. Because because I think it might just be more that then. Well, for me, it might be that there's a, a fascination with how the, 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 the belief in what the person's doing, because they're not, they're not conforming to any other particular system. They've, they've made choices to follow something through regardless of satisfying any other system. And, then, and, so, and so many of those people might end up in, in the art world and never know, or not care, or be surprised, or... You know, I was at um, an opening on Friday in a small area of Birmingham called Borsal Heath, and there's a Borsal Heath biennial going on that two artists have um, set up. And in, this, in one of their houses, they've got a show of work at the moment, and in the front room was this quite magnificent model that a local resident had made of, all, of the whole building where he lives, which is quite a big social complex, and um, sort of made this model for no particular reason other than they wanted to make a model of it, and it had made it in such a way that it was quite impressive. Big, I think this, big. yeah, I think the time factor is also fascinating for yeah. a lot of people because it's, time seems not to matter, and usually often they are very intense, and there's not, um, it's, the, the saying, the way is the goal, is quite present often yeah. in those... I mean, it could be that the, the people who have set up these projects and shows or the in, showing the interest in it, it, it might be 
that they are interested in countering the ways that the art world is, is at the moment being tempted to be forced to, to be regulated and controlled mm -hmm. by external um, value ju judgments. So at the moment, all art has to be considered to be economically viable, mm -hmm. and it might have to be considered to be socially uh, beneficial. Or, so lots of other exterior forces are trying to impose mm -hmm. reasons why art should exist. So to present the outsider art and how you know you, you were just talking about it, it's it's to it, it's to explain and reveal, give examples of why it is an essential element of just being human that people will will do it. And that, it, and so, and that isn't the reason why the, you you don't give any public funding, or you you turn it only into a business. But it is it is a reason why art is necessary. It is a reason why art will always happen. So, but it's really they sort of they're, they might be saying it, it's happening, but then no one ever engages with it or learns anything from it or does the next step on if that outside a moment that someone's investing in for whatever reason, a reason that we might not even understand, it, it's all for, for nothing somehow, unless we do give it the honour of being exhibited. And that's, for me, is what art is. It is in this mode of exhibition. It is about being exhibited. So that outsider artist isn't making art until, until it it's fits into a mode of being exhibited. Well, it depends so. because there's a split how it's defined. There are people who haven't been trained, but often it's also referred to people who come from mental institutions, let's say, yeah. and they very well make the work without even thinking it's going to be exhibited. One they finished, it's yeah. done, it's out of their mind, and that there are big shows by Judy Scott or so, I think that's not in relation. It doesn't have as much in touch with their life somehow. It's, it has this, it's a separate life. Yeah, and so it's, <clears> not, it, it's, um, it's just a surplus activity of that person's life. Yeah. But it, it, I think it, the, the idea of taking, presenting that in another situation then is a very powerful, um, a powerful moment where it does mm. become art. And that's just what's happening at Venice. And it, I think in Venice, some people crit would criticise that because it seems then that the curator or the institution are authoring these works by revealing them for the first time or putting them in context with other works that were intended to be exhibited, inten intended to, to, to be mm. artworks. So I think there's something interesting in yeah. there. But, I, but now, now I like this idea that it's a forceful um, educating process for those who wish to control art through other means. I don't like this either. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah. Otherwise, uh, that's, en that's enough for that one. Yeah, that's next enough one. for the next I one. think so. Too. What's the next one? Uh, shall I? Uh, I think the actual questions you asked me about are like influential works for me or yes. like artists. Yeah. So um, I chose those two, two pieces. The top one is by Urs Fischer. It's called Chet Set Lady, and it's a half a pear and half an apple screwed together. Mm -hmm. And the one below is a really old piece by Paul McCarthy. Mm -hmm. And Paul McCarthy yeah, is from, I think, 68, and then was remade in 75. So a really old piece. And um, especially Paul McCarthy meant a lot to me when I was studying. I still like his work, but it's not so significant anymore. And I really, um, I think the question, I can't remember what the question mm. you asked me was. What, uh, your personal, uh, a favorite artwork that you were always drawn back to? Yeah, I'm not sure if that's, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if that's um, yeah, the case necessarily, but with those two, I found it interesting um, that the, the whole earth ray otherwise is really excessive and opulent and then it's really interesting that the, <clears throat> in this um, in this two quite minimal pieces a, a lot of the mindset is already that and if it, I think actually those pictures relate to the questions I asked you to ask me, and I think there's a misunderstanding <laughs> I realize now, but it doesn't matter. I think I was, one, was wondering if you found that um, it's always 
or the opulence is always necessary um, when there's already the strong kind of um, strong idea in a, in, a, in a minimal kind of yeah. angle of the piece. Let's say, take Paul McCarthy. If well, anyone... I, I, I mean, I, I know the Urs Fischer piece, mm. and I was surprised to see what it was called. I think it's called Jet Set Lady. Because mm -hmm. in my mind, it's always just, it's just apple and pears. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. enough in a way. And so that, that, that is this fantastic image of, of London from an outsider's point of view to come into London and spend time there and to make this work that is half an apple and half a pear hanging together, joined. So it's, and I think he made it when he was in London at Delphina okay. Studios and hanging around there for a, quite a while. Okay. So, and, and I know that when Keith Wilson and Penelope Curtis curated the show on sculpture for the Royal Academy, that Keith really wanted to include that work in it because it, it was so London, it was so much about London and such a simple, um, event, the idea of a sculpture as an event that will break down these two materials together that might represent a city, but they will just go mouldy together and lo you know, lose the water from them, shrink and bond together somehow, which happens in a lot of his works, that they might, they might make a wall with potatoes under it and eventually the potatoes will turn to liquid and the wall might fall over because it loses its foundation. So there's which again then as a, as a metaphor for the idea of the city and how that might change over time. I quite like that. I mean, that isn't what's obviously mm -hmm. what's happened to London in the last <laughs> 15 years since he was, or 10 years since he was making that work. In fact, the opposite, it's just become firmer, more moist and shiny and exotic. And every time I, I turn up now, it's just, you know, so many more little coffee shops all over the apples and pears and, and it's just um, you know, such a fantastic opposite of that somehow. The, the other piece I remember it's called Dead H yeah. and I think it has already strong bodily references that are more ob obvious and visceral in its other work yeah. but a lot of the information is already in there. I think it's a lot about inside outside and I think he remade it in a, like a size of a human being. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, so there's a real relationship of that to the typeface and yeah. to the titling of your works. Mm -hmm. And that, that you were interested in that because it also isn't, doesn't have this multi-layered, messy, yeah, and, well, lots now, of I mean, things yeah. going when it's I go back, simple yeah. artwork. Another piece I chose is uh, The Painter by him. The Painter, have you seen the video, The Painter? Yeah. And um, yeah, um, in his earlier work, a lot of the energy still applies now in, in, in like opulent um, installation. Often the in, a lot of the information is already in one object itself. It doesn't need to be multiplied times thousand. So um, I, sometimes I wonder if that actually makes the work better it's not necessary in relation to my own work. And this, did you read, did you read that before? Yeah, I read that. Yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. thinking. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is nice. this is about the H. Um, the the painters. That's more about. Um, I, mean, I should read that out because I think it's, there's a really yeah. nice phrase. It says, yeah. "I was concerned with the inability to see into something." In the 90s, I talked about how that piece was related to the body. I assumed that I had not thought. I, I had not thought that thought in the 60s, which is when he, when he made it, so... He remade it 75. It's that yeah. H, it's just the, the, the open tubes at the bottom. And that he'd, that he'd called it... So he hadn't, he hadn't had that thought in the 60s. Then he started going through his drawings for the show, and I realised that I had titled it Dead H, H is for human. So in 68, I had thought about this association of the shape of the piece to the body, and I had related the body to minimalism. In 1999, I finally made the dead H big enough to get in. Which is very yeah, nice. Which, really is, nice. which is paralleling a little bit what you were saying about your early, the paper ones and then scaling them up and making them in another material. Yeah, and also be. relating the object to the human size and human yeah. body. And yeah. So the heads that you make, they are... Yeah, in the way they are, I mean, yeah. In the ceramics. Yeah, I, um, I always try to avoid to make things too literal, but in a way they are, yes. And what about the, 
the connotations of your work towards the sort of horrific, the horror, the carnivalesque that's also there in Paul McCarthy's work, this confrontational moment. Is that quite, is that intentional? It's intentional, but again, I try to um, make it a personal discovery for the audience, for the viewer. Yeah. I try um, to give it maybe more than one reading, but of course it's certainly, I mean, it's, in some pieces it's, um, it's certainly present and is, again, is a <clears throat> more than one existence of there's something beautiful and horrible at the same time, for yeah. example. Well, like H is for human and H is for horror. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new typeface that you can do. Yeah, I would like to work more with typefaces, actually. And what's the... So the next one was the rosemary truckle? It's yeah, a tiny little picture. Yeah, yeah, certainly for me an influential artist, also in relation to the titling, actually. And that picture this piece rose. called Replace Me. It's, the it's that photograph. It's a the, photograph, but we don't need to talk... I think you memory. asked me about my titling. Yeah, we spoke about yeah. that before. And um, so I think Rosa Matruk is certainly an influential artist because she has a lot of humor in her work and has a feminist aspect without being, putting it in the forefront. Also, um, one of the f artists, I guess, feminine artists who start um, using wool or making work on feminine subjects without, um, without with the use of humor. And she has um, hilarious titles. I mean, she called the whole exhibition post-menopause. I think that's, if you don't, if, if you have so much self-distance, I think then you really um, achieved something. And yeah, and then the, she had this exhibition in Serpentine, this, uh, this neon piece called Spiral Betty. She has really nice titles and yeah. uh, always, uh, it's, it's like another dimension to the work. I really, and I mean, I'm not sure if I achieved that and I'm, Hers are more philosophic, less abstract, definitely, because mine I have more maybe a data element to it. But um, certainly an influential person for me. Yeah. And have you managed to meet her yet? No. Or would that be? Yeah, you, that would be fantastic. Be, yeah. yeah, I think that's always interesting when you can have that meeting with yeah. someone and you've already got your question lined up in a way. So you've got some kind of I'm not sure <laughs> what way to ask about it about works and then you just have to see you have to find out what sort of person she really is up close that's all you don't know what sort of feedback you, you get from from an artist or whether they're horrified that you would think that about their work or connected to their work in some way or other which sometimes is the reason why why you might not speak yeah. to an artist mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. don't want to shatter your illusions or... I don't know what I would <laughs> wouldn't ask any <laughs> But it's a, it's um, I find it, I find it genuinely an unsettling image. Yeah, it is <laughs> for everyone, even the woman portrayed. Yeah, I don't <clears throat> know if everyone else does. Find it. Yeah. I don't know if it makes. It's just one image. I mean, I like the image, but it's just. It was a part actually exhibited in Berlin, a really interesting exhibition called Animism. And um, it's also something I'm interested in when objects are portrayed as subjects and you kind of believe in they have a soul in themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a really good choice for this exhibition. Mm -hmm. And you might have to hold it up to the camera there for people to see it. They need to see the other bit of paper, the clothes. <laughs> the spider one. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> oh God, it looks even more dirty now. It's the, yes, that, <laughs> that's the high tech, the high tech approach going on there. <laughs> we need that back then, I think. I think that's yeah, one last image. Have we got another and, one? Then we, and then we can maybe open up to the audience. Ah, it's the George Condo. It's called Smiling Girl with Black Hair. And this was a, an interest, a shared interest and reference or connection to Picasso. Yeah. I mean, George Condo is a fantastic artist. I could use any of his paintings. I wouldn't, I, I think there's none one I don't like. But um, he also is interested in the mental states and, um, <clears throat> mm. and I think this idea of a coexistence he has in his work as well. And I'm, 
I haven't met him either, but I'm pretty certain, apart from that he copies Picasso and he obviously, if you know his work, he obviously makes quite um, obvious like versions of artists' work. Yeah. And what, but, what um, do you think his approach to that depicting of mental states is? Do you think that there's a... They're there's quite a, hysterical. Yeah. And... Um, but do you think that the way that he does it is just to reference other artworks, other ways of Im image making, and then to take that no, as it's a not just. Moment. Yeah, no, I think it's just, uh, it's a vehicle, but it's not just to um, reference other artworks, it's a vehicle to, because he cre creates his own images, he, li he works from li life models, he creates whole scenarios, mm. I've seen pictures of like setups in his studio. I, I find his work really interesting, really fascinating. But, I, but I'm, I'm never quite, I'm never certain what's, what quite is the agenda in, in the work of how to exactly approach it. Like, how would the depicting of mental states differ? That's not the only agenda. I think no, it just... But in a way, if you to question like how the, the notion of the contemporary, I like the idea of the, the mental states, yeah. like the contemporary mental state to a Picasso that might look, operate a very similar way, how you would have you know, a 70 year gap in how uh, you'd be portraying somebody and how to approach the two things. Could you approach them in the same way or as well? Well, it becomes mental when Condra does it. It's not necessarily mental when Picasso yeah, did it. It makes yeah. me want it to be. Yeah, yeah, like no. The, the I think it's, you... it's more it's still just like different perspectives in within one person. Yeah, but that's when you get this notion of theorizing or suddenly... And it's the past changes instead of the yeah, present. You rewrite, yeah, you that's know, quite rewrite nice. all yeah, yeah. Picasso's <laughs> reasons for making Because of Kondo, I like this uh, yeah. the idea. <laughs> but it works backwards. So Kondo isn't influenced by Picasso, but the way that we perceive Picasso is influenced by what Kondo does or by what you do. Yeah. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> so how do you... Because there was an, one of the images that you wanted to show um, was of Thai man. Oh, yeah. Which is this exquisite, um, re reduced form of a face, so almost a, re a rectangular face with just a subtle um, relief to it, like a piece of paper that's just had a couple of folds in it that might make the planes of a face. And the mouth is a cutout at the bottom, and around the mouth, a tie goes through the whole of the mouth and around as if the, and, and when you look at it, it feels completely right that the tie is just sitting on this head and the tie falls down, but then you realize the tie is actually tied through the mouth and uh, uh, all the way around and out the bottom and down again. So, which I was, when I was looking at it again, it sort of shocked me that I didn't quite remember that how it does that. How is the so tie is the tie tied? is whole, you know, restraining you and has this sort of bondage aspect to it when I'd always liked the idea of it as a a, men, a state, a, a depiction of the mental state of businessmen or something like that. <laughs> but then also the tie is leather. It's a black leather tie so it made me think of discos a little bit as well. So there was this sort of half <laughs> like a sort of dodgy 1980s disco they are I might have worn a tie like that too as a 14-year-old going to the disco thinking this is the coolest thing in the world to have a black leather tie. <laughs> and obviously it was, but um, it, it, it made me think of that and still something about business. All it wrapped up in this, all, you know, it's like, a, like someone started to do an origami thing but at the kettle boiled and so they just put the piece of paper down and went to go and make a cup of tea. And that, that, with the, but within those two folds before they really started it, there was enough, which is the, your technical, that question about the technical oh, okay. pinnacle or something, There's, there is something in there, but then what, how, it feels like Picasso as well, <laughs> it, it, when, he, when I look at it, I, I, things that I know about Picasso or works that I've seen just come straight through me in the way that I perceive things. Yeah, it's okay. You, you gave us warning. You gave us warning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this doesn't, I have pieces that might relate to his work, they, this doesn't, it's, it relates, I think the ceramic part is actually, if anything, relates more to the simplicity of a mask, and then, um, 
Um, it was in correspondence with another piece I made called Chopper that relates to a handbag out of, made, out, made from ceramic. The tie men, the leather tie, um, related maybe to the shop aspect I'm playing with in, in form of display, but also in form of object. But it was also personal play because I, um, I wanted it to have this like long, let's say, tongue that looks like a leather tie. And for whatever reason, I very rarely use uh, ready-mades. I, I like artists who do use ready-mades, so it's not a statement in that sense. But some of the things always have to go through my hands, so I try to emulate this leather thing that should look like a leather tie. Then Christian said, why don't you try to get a leather tie? Because it didn't feel right. So, um, <clears throat> so um, actually sometimes it's just, uh, in this case it was the right thing just to use the thing it's supposed to look like. And, um, yeah. And that, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the dis display structures then, because you just sort of introduced that, the idea of the shopping element, which somehow, I, I mean, especially mm -hmm. the, the one with, that has the lights uh, in, the, in the Perspex tops, it pushes it even more <coughs> into, into that realm as well. So that, but in a way I hadn't, I hadn't, it's Quite not thought always. of it as much yeah. as, as that because because the, the idea of the ready-made of the Memphis furniture. So there was um, a structure similar to these that was made for the exhibition that happened at Eastside Projects, and that was was. Uh, this was, was relating a, yeah. to a Memphis piece in so terms of proportions and form, yeah, I mean, remake without the formica yeah. and without the glossiness. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but how? And, and prior to that, there was only one of the, you made one of the structure like that, that was in the yeah. show at Arcade. Yes, yes. So, and now then this becomes a really key element in how to make the exhibition. It does more and more, no. So how, to how does that, um, how, how is that evolution, how does that work? Just because that's over about two years that you've, mm -hmm. that you've been making these, yeah. these systems. Well, the first pieces I made were like the metal, s <coughs> metal stands with ceramic on top. That when I, as soon as I enlarged them, when I actually did what I wanted from the paper objects, they became quite modernist and polite. And um, it, it didn't have, in retrospective, too much for my liking. Um, now when I use metal and ceramic together, they, uh, the proportions are different, so it's, it's okay, it's more like a, a display Part almost, um, and then I had the idea to um, <clears throat> obviously it's a display solution as well it was to begin with the furniture to mm. house the ceramics, and then um, you realize it's the the dialogue happening. It just becomes more and more part of the sculpture, and because my ceramic work is so loose, it needs like a hard edge against it, something kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so I find really important to have this other component. I think I often work in like, not extremes, but in, yeah, let's say, juxtapositions, and this is one of them. One of my questions was, what might be your dream exhibiting condition? <laughs> but I'm wondering whether that's already in the answer, in a way that you're constructing your dream exhibiting conditions in these portable, units and displays. Yeah, if you, in an abstract way it's true and it really when I did set up the exhibition here coming from somewhere else it was some like a familiar f friend somehow it was really good to have that already to um, not completely start from scratch again in the space so it actually really worked as this habitat. Yeah. Yeah. And then you also mentioned earlier that you do like going into a new space and just trying to strip it back. And uh, so, in, in a way, are you, do you enjoy the other elements of a, of, a, of a room or an environment? Would you prefer it not to be um, a pared down, minimal, sort of flat environment? Would you prefer other elements and features to be there? It, it depends. I mean, if the space is quite minimal in the first place, I, I'm happy to work with that. I just. Um, I, I find it, what I meant earlier is I find it difficult when I, it's quite clear that someone put those fake 
additions into the space for as a to kind of to direct an exhibition in a certain way, and then I like to strip that back. But if the space is minimal to begin with, it's um, I wouldn't I don't know if there is an ideal form. Um, it's fine as well. I can't say uh, it's not better or worse one or the other. Yeah. I, I just like to use it as a starting point, and if the space is really minimal, then the exhibition furniture would then maybe become more gothic or so, or mm -hmm. yeah, that's might what become I'm more carrier. Yeah. And I'm happy to um, obviously push that, and this is a challenge for me in the future. To, um, to, um, I, I want to work more with a typeface and lettering and also furniture, and maybe bring the two together. Yes, I, I like in here the chandeliers to these because you begin to treat, think of the chandelier like this rug, like th that question about writing, like would it be hard to write about this rug, that you, instead I would think it would be, I would, it would be interesting to wear the rug. That's how you'd respond It comes to it. from a fur so, coat, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> and so, that, and so, and then you begin to look at the room and say, how would you use, how would you use your artwork, and how would you use the chandelier? So to swing on it would be like to wear the rug. But I like if things look like they or, look like could be worn because I've yeah. been asked many times if I, if I could imagine making a performance with my masks or so. Mm -hmm. I like the performativity of the object. I don't necessarily see myself or anyone else performing with it. Yeah. I'm not saying generally completely no to performance, but I think if I would make an object for performance, it would be of different nature. Right. Yeah, that would be an interesting ask. Yeah, well, don't ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we haven't, we haven't got those other images, so we can't do them. So let's just, let's see, there's anyone left? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just have a look at the other images. Um, yeah, let's see, I think there's one more. Yeah, 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 Yeah, you first and then you second. <laughs> I agree that there's a, a different sense and a different feeling in the fit when I look at this setting. Um, how do you feel about how it looks at Harbisher and how it looks now? What's your opinion? What's my opinion? Yeah. Um, so with the ceramic work when there is no technical setup yeah. because it's quite different, um, they have a really it's a strong concentration. I really like that you come, you come closer to the ceramic work. So in a way, the ceramic work, if I can separate, I prefer here. At the Tufty piece, it's more site-specific than I thought. So, um, because um, <clears throat> I never made a hanging piece before, and I think um, the shape of the piece has a correspondence to the, to the fact it's hanging, so maybe I prefer that at the other space. I mean, it's a bit prefer, not prefer, it's a bit banal yeah. maybe to see it in that way. When I came back today, I really liked it on the wall now as well. So it's, um, it's, it obviously you project onto things already beforehand if you have seen it somewhere else. And today I felt like I, I saw it, I didn't think about what, it, what I would feel like. So today actually, um, I, what I quite like, it's, it's still kind of like this, Protector still has a strong relationship to the ceramic wood. It's, um, it's a shame we can't show the image because it, it is dramatically different. I am. It's a really yeah, it's good in point here. I can it show looks, it. Well, I mean, uh, it's I, like, it's like um, I mean, uh, quite a few people have seen it. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how it felt in the flesh, but looking at the image, it feels a bit to me like there it was, there it's, it's like between a, a wild standing, yeah. bear, and it's the right. bear in the space, and here now it's a stuffed bear. And so actually it's both of those positions are really interesting, that, it, that a work, an artwork could take on both of those modes as if it's uh, exhibiting in different ways. You know, one is exhibiting as a, almost an anim, animate object. Uh, anim, what I like an, here, yeah, yeah. Ob object. here I like the shadow, they, it had no shadow, yeah. and it looks, it has something from, from a shed skin, I like that as well, that it had maybe had a life before. So there's, yeah. Also, it had the skin-like aspect there as well. Yeah. 
done. No, you have, you have to. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Did he make an entire alphabet? The designer made an entire alphabet. Because like some of the letters, like the, U, the U's, yeah. are different O's yeah. and the C's. Are, and you were saying so yeah, it's a good question. I think that was, he made the first, the typeface for the, uh, he yeah. made the, the title for the exhibition. When he made the alphabet, there's only one O. Yeah, it's just to make the look, the, this, the cam cool look good. He, yeah. uh, which one did he use? I think. Oh, actually, it's a difference between capital and small, oh, I think. Okay. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And you were saying you might like to work with yeah, types. Right. Yeah, I would like to. And some, it's funny, it comes round and round in art. Um, when I look at the whole alphabet, some look like objects so much so that you almost would like to make them back into a furniture. Mm -hmm. I was thinking but, maybe that's your name. Yeah. Like Not so I'm easy to, it's easier to write it down than to make it into an object. I mean, I can't do that. Yeah. That is the one skill I don't have, for example. That's just reminding me of a question I meant to ask you when we talk about the furniture. Um, are any of the works yet uh, directly, that they will only exist on that form? Or, or because I know that you, you still, you interchange and you... Mm -hmm. I no, and yeah, I haven't made this decision yet. I mean, they, I would still show them in a different context. Yeah. It's not it's amazing one how they sculpture essay. Yeah, exactly. On a wall or on, on the edge, sitting on top on a stand. And at thing. one point those furnitures might be discarded as I keep the ceramic. I might not forever be able to keep the furniture. So it's yeah. it's the idea of it, the existence, the document is important. The wooden box per se, maybe not. If you see what I mean, still a vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> So that's going to partly depend on the destination of the work, whether when something reaches a point where it enters into a collection, or yeah, enters well, into then, a, yeah. and then, and then that's you, you saying that is that's the right configuration, mm -hmm. and that that should stay like that. Yeah, Until, that would be an option. Yeah, or unless they buy options, somebody who's collecting a number of options, and can that can be, which I think is is interesting to think about that. That you would considering that question of the ideal exhibition space. I think it's quite exciting for an artist to take control of those conditions because, say, if your work is going into a collection, what you're relying on is 50 years' time, someone else making a decision to put your work at the right height, on the right material, mm, uh, you know, all those things that, in a way, you, you're providing a really good system so that the work always has a set of conditions. The way that you see yeah. that, which yeah. you now like. So, uh, so that's that's the other thing that you well you could build that in. You, equally, you could say, I want a curator in fifty years' time to think of a new way to show my work yeah, yeah, that's yeah, really, that, that relates to the conditions of that time that I haven't considered yet. Which would also be a brave gesture on an artist yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, part. But I think with you know that is that that's the life of the artworks, isn't it? That you do have to think about those things, and in some way there is a. There's a nod towards controlling it, but in a, in a very playful way that connects to the work. That you're, yeah. you're already doing that, you're already curating your own work within the... Within yeah, the I, it's... Yeah. Somehow, because the ceramic work itself, it, it needs a certain context, and it helps to create the context itself. It's not always necessarily there, especially in a group or exhibition context. Yeah. Has anyone else got another question? Because I have. I had another one. Actually, sorry. Yeah. When I saw one of your works ages ago, I I imagined it in a in a historic property. And you talked about like display and how you actually you like to go into a place and 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 strip it back to kind of what it what it was. And thinking about the masks and things like in a in a, an older house. And then again, that idea you were just saying with me about. Artwork isn't just about in galleries. Sometimes it's yeah. in people's houses and have, but then it's an older house and a, that would look amazing. Also, the tufted work, yeah. Another, you know, like like the stone is just packed always. Mm. So your decision on the pieces that you put in, or mm. or a house that hasn't got furniture in, or saying I've always wanted to see your bits, mm. you know, like hidden hidden gems, kind mm. of but in a again, there's displayed. They're not in a 
Yeah, I would, for example, the Freud Museum I would like to show there. Mm. <coughs> they have really great exhibition. <laughs> yeah. Next year, any slots? Yeah. <laughs> Speak to Christian, he'll sort you out. <laughs> which leads to my question, which it, I liked when you slipped in this, when you were talking about how the Thai man was made, that there was a moment in the conversation with Christian as your, your dealer, your gallerist, re representing you, about that, that conversation leads to a f the final outcome of an artwork, which I think is really, is really good to show, because it, to, to imagine that all artworks you know, are made in this isolated space where you finish something and produce it, and then it goes out into the world, is, is also part of the myth, in some ways, of, of the artists. And I know it's, it's not, not a very... Um, guarded myth, it's quite, it's, it's quite known, but still, it, I think there's something interesting there about what, which relationships with which people also help to fuel how you make the work and, and, and that the supports you as an, as an artist. Yeah, I mean, a lot of solutions come in, a, especially if you're not maybe happy with a, sp a specific part of a piece or like a, you need a dialogue, you need something to bounce off and it, it just happens that your maybe gallerist is quite familiar with your work yeah. and also with your personality and then can, can, this can um, push a stuck moment forward. But that, you know, in a way that could be part of the idea of what, what are the good conditions yeah. that you would want yeah, to make an exhibition is that you have, there are people and it's, you know, it's great if it is the person that you work with in the, in, in, who runs the gallery and represents you, that you can have those conversations with, that you can, that genuinely they, they get the work so much that it, that it um, enriches it and that you can trust yeah. all those judgments. But are you the sort of person who would uh, try and ask people's opinions about things like that all the time, or no. are very few I mean, it's actually an exception. No, it's yeah. not that I ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to... Like I'm, if you're in the studio, you just suddenly run out, I, I need see. someone to come and help yeah. me work this out, and then you pull It was it more when I tried to install it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually more the miss you described. I do work, spend a lot of time on my own in yeah. the studio and figure out the things myself. Build the but, myth, um, come on, build it up. But when I, in terms of installation, I recently had an exhibition at Pear, for example, and they have really great curatorial stuff, and I had this idea of painting the wall behind a tufted piece in a in peach, let's say, and I, wasn't, I was insecure about doing so. I've never done that before, and it's quite good if you have like a, a devil on your side to really say, yeah, go for it, pushes it, yeah, and, and um, it's always good to embrace the... Uh, <clears throat> they experiment and not just shy away from it might not work or might ruin something and then it's extra work as well. I think you should always, as a curator or if you run a yeah, space, well, you should I'm always yeah, never shy away from complications. Yeah, well, as we were putting the exhibition together at Eastside Projects, there was it, that there was a the really open yes. um, discussion about the colours. I about the colours now. on it and, yeah. and the positioning and how to make all those things work together and it becomes a really shared enterprise mm -hmm. which I think is really is really great. Everyone feels committed to it and it's there was an openness between you and the other two artists and me and Ruth as the curators about how all those things could go together and, and for trying things out, testing things out. Yeah. And, you know, and not to be too shy to also yes. be against something. Yeah. I think often it's like uh, artists can also be treated too carefully, so yeah. it's good to push it as well. <laughs> <laughs> residency and the process of the residency and the conditions for that in relation to just, just what we've been talking about. Um, just did you have a studio? Did you work with collaboratively? Did you work with students? Did you what was the conditions of the residency? How did it come about? So I have a studio anyway, the tufted work I make there for example because I, I need certain I have a gut I need a tufting gun, a certain facility. So this was entirely the ceramic work and I don't have a kiln or anything. 
So I was allowed at certain times to use their facilities. Who, and it, who, where was this? Where uh, was sorry, this in, in Hertfordshire, uh, okay. where I met Faye or another student there. And um, <clears throat> so there were, I had open access and um, I had the luxury of not only necessarily my own kiln, but the first time I had like space in a kiln before, before and I always worked in community colleges where you have to share a kiln with lots of people and it was, became a problem. The work became bigger and accidents happened. So um, I had lots of support and so I was working alongside other students, um, but I did more or less my own thing, but alongside um, I, men I did mentor students, so there were, there were contacts and I gave tutorials. But while I did the work, I, yeah, alongside others, I did my own thing, basically. But I mean, I could use whatever I wanted to use. They were very supportive. And, but for the exhibition furniture, I, um, because I wanted to push it further from the predecessor, I did at Eastside Project. I saw they have a design department as well, <clears throat> so with the um, product design students, I gave them a briefing. I said, if maybe anyone would be interested to develop together with me exhibition furniture. And um, <laughs> only two students came back to me. They were so busy and tied up in other projects. I think they were too busy in a way. They didn't realize this is an amazing opportunity because it was on display for maybe six weeks and then bang in their kind of um, gallery space. But one fantastic student, Bowen, <coughs> Chinese student, came back to me and she came from a completely different uh, direction. She was working with bent wood, like something that in no way could have been afforded anyway. So I, I showed her um, what interests me and she showed me what interests her and this kind of um, furniture is uh, outcome of that. So in a way, if you try to ignore the, this, and where everything, anything technically standing on this uh, two shapes and those two shapes, there is a bit like Tetris-like figuration. So really you can slot them in, it was a bit like playing with Lego before I finally decided in which figuration it would stand and which pieces to put on. So it's really a great idea to make them interslottable. And um, so in, there's also a, maybe it's less, um, present here now because of the other pieces, but they also have a playful element to them, I find. My words were pixels, Minecraft, trophies, bondage, and horror. Yeah. <laughs> what you, can you, I you add? Know, it's fantastic. You know Minecraft? Do Minecraft. Your, do your kids play Minecraft yet? No. It's the, it's the, it's a com like it's the a computer shared ah, okay. reality. Time consuming. It's a good title um, for a show, actually. Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's all made of blocks, and, and there's a whole. Um, like my son's got a t shirt that's got the periodic table of Minecraft elements on it. So it's, it's really detailed. It's good. And, and it's, yeah, but it has the feel of how all these elements go together as well. So it's, yeah. Yeah, it's quite nice. This isn't really a, a question, it's more of an observation. Um, I see the, um, your exhibition at University of Hertfordshire as well. I teach there as well, so they, and that's why I was asking mm -hmm. about your engagement with the students. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and the space between there and here is incredibly different in the sense that there it's much more of a social kind of space because of the cafe and it's like a walkthrough foyer, very problematic. Um, so it's really nice to kind of see it in this in the conditions of this space, which feels more um, controlled, or you know, that you, that you kind of walk in yeah. and there's a dead end, you walk around and you walk out the same way as you came in, where the space at the University of Hertfordshire is much more of a walk through thoroughfare. So, the, this piece, um, suspended, uh, became quite, um, quite sort of lively as a, as a thing, you know, so you can walk around it. And you can experience it at different angles, but it's quite, because the um, surroundings are very busy, it's quite hard to sort of get a distilled sort of snapshot of it like you can here. Mm -hmm. That's my... Do you prefer it here? Yes. Yeah, good to know. It's um, nice to have one that's been here and there. I like the, um, the sculptural properties of it here. 
as well, the way it hits the floor mm. is grounded, then it seems. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, where it was that you were best part of the was, was much more kind of. Uh, sort of well, light, but it's a heavy thing. <laughs> yeah. Atmosphere. Yeah, this, I was amazed. This, I couldn't get my head around it when I installed it in the first place. I wasn't sure what I'm looking at because I knew the space uh, piece I was making for an Hertfordshire, where it would be what the space looked like before I knew what the piece would be. So it was really made for this spot. But even in the round, you, know, you were able to see it. In the back. it yeah, that's also... Three-dimensionality, three which is normally here, so you don't get the full advantage of seeing it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, so I think we have managed to do something that Caroline likes uh, to do, to not explain the work. So hopefully that, I think <laughs> that's important. That's it would be important bit of my job to not explain the work enough to have over explained it to you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Caroline. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.